The octet rule isn't a rule. There, I've said it. If you've studied chemistry at school, you will have heard about the octet rule. Roughly speaking, it says that atoms are most stable with a full outside shell of electrons. In other words, a full valence shell of electrons. And what this means is that atoms will gain, lose or share electrons to obtain this full outside shell. Now, before we go on, remember that every time I say electrons, I mean valence electrons. We can't do chemistry with inner shells of electrons because it takes too much energy. We can change them with physics. That's how we make x-rays, for example. But we can't do it with chemistry. Now, we use Lewis diagrams to visualise how these electrons build up in layers around the nucleus of an atom. And we imagine that it's a bit like onions with a new layer full of electrons, more and more electrons as these shells get larger. It's not really true, but it works most of the time. Remember that an empty shell is the same thing as no shell at all. And you'll learn in more complex models of atomic and molecular structure that half full shells are also relatively stable. So this is directly related to the shape and structure of the periodic table. Each new shell of electrons gives us a new period or row of the periodic table. And every time we add a new proton and its partner electron, we move along towards the right. We move along another group. So strictly speaking, we should start with the doublet rule for hydrogen and helium because there's only two spaces for electrons in their small little shell. However, we don't want to remember lots of different names for rules. So we just learn that one under the umbrella of the octet rule. And as you should know, helium has already filled its outside shell with electrons, so it doesn't do any more chemistry. Now remember, Atoms don't really look like this. Electrons don't really orbit around the nucleus of an atom the way that planets orbit around the sun. But it's a really simple model and it works to understand the basic concepts. But with the next period, we get the famous octet rule. Now there are eight potential spaces for electrons. And the number eight is where octet comes from. It's Greek for eight. And science has traditionally used Greek and Latin words since the early days. Now, there's also the octet rule's big brother, the 18 electron rule. And why don't we use Greek anymore? Well, it's partly because the Deca octet rule is too much of a mouthful, but also it's because, you know, as I said before, we don't want to remember lots of different names for essentially the same rule. But in addition, we don't hear about it so much because at this point, we've started running into problems. In fact, we start running into problems with the octet rule all the way back in period three. That's right, we've only moved one period down and we're already having trouble with the octet rule. Textbooks rarely spend much time talking about the octet rule in relation to period three. Now, if you're lucky, you will have been told some things about expanded octets, compounds where at least one atom is breaking the octet rule. But in my opinion, it's never explained very well. Let's take a look at sulfur in the sulfate ion. It's got 12 electrons. That's not an octet. It's the same for chlorine in the perchlorate ion. Crucially, the octet rule doesn't explain what's going on when it is broken. There were just some kind of hand wavy explanations about what's going on that don't really make any sense. 
Uh, 3D orbitals. Uh, electrons go in here, and that's everything. Oh, really? Really? Well, then why don't second row elements break the octet? Why don't they go up one shell more and start using spaces there too? Well, um, second period elements haven't got 3s orbitals. Yes, they have. All atoms have all orbitals. Um, well, it's, it's actually about the energy difference between the orbitals. Oh, is it? Well, then why don't period three atoms use their 4s orbital? That's lower in energy than the 3d orbital. Um, yes, but not in a molecule. Oh, we're going there, are we? We're going there? Well, you should know that there are at least three degenerate orbitals in an octahedral compound. So that means the elements can expand their octet all the way up to at least 14. No more questions today. So why don't we have more combinations? Why don't we have, for example, I don't know, ClO2N2 or ClO6? All of this means that the octet rule is a post hoc rule. In other words, it explains what happened after the fact. They help us with expectations, but they cannot be relied upon. What certainly does happen is that larger atoms can make larger molecules. So chlorine, for example, can make a molecule where it's surrounded by five fluorine atoms, whereas iodine can go all the way up to seven. A better explanation is that larger atoms can be surrounded by more smaller atoms. So the octet rule isn't a hard and fast rule. In fact, maybe we should think of it as more of a guideline. The octet guideline. Calling it a rule and pretending that it is a hard and fast rule confuses students who spend time learning it and then have to learn some kind of extra bit that's been tagged on the end about expanded octets. I was certainly confused about the octet rule for the whole time that I was a student because it simply didn't make a complete story. So why do we have to learn it? Why do I teach it to my students? Because for all its faults, it works as a good place to start, a first handhold to understand how it is that atoms form the compounds that they do. And we can explain so many things. For example, why water is H2O, but methane is CH4. Or explain why organic molecules are the way they are. But more importantly, we can do an awful lot of chemistry with just the octet rule. So we use it because it's simple, and for most scientists and engineers, it gets the job done. For those of us who are educators, we need to be honest about its flaws and to admit that expanded octets are flaws in this theory. We should stop trying to suggest that all of it makes sense, including expanded octets, because of some half-formed reasoning that just leaves students and teachers trying to make sense of something which is not necessarily true. I have certainly seen some horrific explanations on the internet to try and justify expanded octets. And there's nothing wrong with admitting that the octet rule has flaws. This is how science works. This is what sets it apart from politics and religion. We make rules based on the evidence before us and change those rules as more evidence comes in. And it's okay to continue to use simple but flawed rules as long as it fits its purpose, which in the octet rule is to enable school students, scientists and engineers to get a basic understanding of molecular bonding. So let's just admit these flaws from the beginning and let our students understand this is just a simple concept to get us started.
And if they ever need a more accurate model, well, they can learn it another time. So before I finish, you're probably wondering, how do we explain these multi-atom centers, these broken octets? Well, there are a few ways, but for relative simplicity, I prefer a much more complex model of bonding called molecular orbital theory. Very briefly, all the atoms bring enough orbitals to make any bonds that we want to make. And what actually limits how many atoms can join onto a central atom is simply size. But that's not the only way of looking at things. So if you're really interested, check out the Wikipedia entry for hypervalent molecules. It's in the link in the description. Now, I also found an excellent uh, high school, first year, university level explanation of octet rules that attempts to keep to the traditional interpretation and still use Lewis diagrams. It still has most of the problems that I explained earlier, but if you want to, something to help you for now, once again, check out the link in the description. Now, if you like this video, if it was helpful, then click the like button and I'll make more. And if you subscribe, you'll know when they come out. Everyone's a winner. We'll learn that half full shells are also relatively stable. Oh, for f basic rules of how atoms are.